This underwater photosphere on Google Maps shows a beautiful view of a coral reef not too far from a place called Hogfish Cut on the southern coast of the island of Bermuda. It's very beautiful, but evidently though, at least according to pop culture legends going back nearly 70 years, this patch of sea is cursed and dangerous. We're in the so-called Bermuda Triangle, a patch of ocean where numerous mysterious disappearances of ships and planes are said to have occurred without any reasonable explanation. The key words in that sentence are said to have occurred. When I had the idea to do another video about misconceptions and false narratives in history, I originally rejected the notion of doing one about the Bermuda Triangle, simply because the story is so old and cold and debunked literally decades ago, and I thought no one would be interested. The Bermuda Triangle does not actually exist. Everybody knows that by now, right? Well, no. The simple fact that I'm doing a video titled, Does Anyone Still Believe in the Bermuda Triangle?, should be a clue that the answer is unfortunately yes, which means we have yet another misconception from history ripe for some critical analysis. I'm Sean Munger. I'm a historian, podcaster, and teacher. I teach history classes online at my website, seanmunger.com. My podcasts are Second Decade, a historical show about the 18-teens, the second decade of the 19th century, and Green Screen, where my co-host and I discuss and analyze movies about the environment or in which nature plays a major role. I've also got a story, a fictional podcast called Age of Confusion, premiering in March 2021. This is an alternate history show set beginning in the 1960s. The Bermuda Triangle is believed to be a large section of the Atlantic Ocean, usually defined as a triangle, though not always, uh, bordered by the southern coast of Florida, the island of Bermuda, and Puerto Rico. The boundaries of the triangle vary depending on the source you're looking at, uh, and there's not one specific narrative, a canon, so to speak. Hmm, gee, there's a clue that something might be fishy about this story, but we'll get there. Any given media about the Bermuda Triangle doesn't take long to launch into a laundry list of unsolved and mysterious incidents that are said to have occurred in this part of the Atlantic involving ships and airplanes. Just to name a few of the most, most prominent ones, Cyclops, an ore carrier, vanished 1918. Cotopaxi, cargo ship, vanished 1925. Douglas DC-3, NC-160002, airliner, vanished 1948. Marine Sulphur Queen, cargo tanker, vanished 1963. Perry Cohen and Austin Stefanos, teenagers, vanished off a boat in 2015. Many of these incidents are said to have happened in calm water and seas, calm weather and seas. Some tellings claim, not always accurately, that debris or wreckage was not found or that distress signals were not sent. Where most traditional accounts of the Bermuda Triangle start is easily the most famous incident. In December 1945, a formation of five U.S. Navy torpedo bombers left Fort Lauderdale Naval Air Station in Florida on a navigational training flight headed east off the coast of Florida. After some strange radio transmissions from the flight, the group disappeared and no wreckage or bodies were found. According to an oft-quoted account, one of the pilots supposedly said to the control tower, quote, we don't know which way is west, everything is wrong, strange, we can't be sure of any direction, even the ocean doesn't look as it should, end quote. Weather conditions are said to have been calm and there was no explanation for the disappearance of what's usually called Flight 19. Even stranger, say the accounts, a search plane sent to look for Flight 19 also disappeared. Between all of these missing planes, 27 people were lost and unaccounted for. So let's unpack all of this. There certainly are numerous cases throughout history, both recent and more distant, of mysterious things happening to ships and planes. I love these kinds of mysteries. You may recall back in December I did a video on the Mary Celeste, the derelict ship found sailing the Atlantic, deserted, in December 1872. Its crew vanished. Despite the fact that the Mary Celeste's crew vanished nowhere near Bermuda, even this famous nautical mystery, which has a fairly simple explanation, is, some, is sometimes lumped into the story of the Bermuda Triangle. So what are we really dealing with here? What at its heart defines the Bermuda Triangle story? If you think through it logically, it really has two main characteristics. 
Number one, it's a supposedly a definable part of the ocean that is uniquely dangerous, which means that more accidents happen there than in other parts of the world. And number two, the incidents that happen here are unusually mysterious, which means a higher percentage of them are unlikely to result from conventionally understood phenomenon. Notice that these two characteristics are both comparative. The Bermuda Triangle is a thing because it's more dangerous than other parts of the ocean, and what happens there is more mysterious than what happens elsewhere, or that what, what we would expect to happen if not for whatever woo phenomenon you think is causing all these incidents. I think you'd agree that if either or both of these premises are wrong, we can dismiss the Bermuda Triangle idea as having any validity. Now, in a few minutes, we're going to do something that almost no one who considers the Bermuda Triangle story ever does. We're going to engage historically and factually with these two premises. Believers in the Bermuda Triangle almost never think empirically about it. If you doubt that, look at what will inevitably be the negative comments on this video. Very few of them, if any, will actually try to engage with my arguments. Instead, people will call me stupid and a bad historian because I don't subscribe to a false narrative that they believe on a more or less intuitive level is indisputably true. Well, it's not indisputably true, as I will demonstrate. I also anticipate that I'll get objections to the effect of, well, how do you explain this famous case or that famous case or whatever? These objections miss the point. I can't explain everything that supposedly happened in the Bermuda Triangle, and I don't have to. Because recall that premise number two is that the Bermuda Triangle, if it exists, is a place where a higher percentage of incidents are unlikely to result from conventionally understood phenomena. In other words, that there are more such unexplainable cases here than there are associated with other place, places in the ocean. So let's take a moment to look at how this false narrative got started. In 1950, a writer named George X. Sands wrote an article in Fate magazine titled Sea Mystery at Our Back Door. It was your typical laundry list of incidents, no conclusions, no analysis, just a list of incidents. There were a couple of other articles in the popular press in the 1950s and 60s, and then the first one to suggest a paranormal cause, Vincent Gaddis's 1964 article in Argosy magazine, which coined the term Bermuda Triangle. Most of these early articles were engaged in the time-honored practice of JAQing, just asking questions, without really suggesting anything. Then the BT hit the big time in 1974 when a language teacher named Charles Berlitz, of the same family that gave us Berlitz language schools, and who moonlighted as a paranormal researcher, wrote a book called The Bermuda Triangle, where he tried to link the BT phenomenon to his other woo obsession that was, wait for it, the lost continent of Atlantis. The mid-1970s was a golden age for this kind of woo. Pseudo-historical, conspiratorial, a bit of new age here, a bit of anti-intellectualism there. And this message, the Bermuda Triangle I mean, was perfectly suited for this time which was rife with pseudo-historical documentaries and questionable TV shows that were technically JAQing, but also ingraining the idea, largely unexamined from a standpoint of logic or evidence, that there was something uniquely fishy about this area of the ocean. In 1975, largely in response to Berlitz's magnum opus, an Arizona State University librarian, Lawrence David Kush, wrote a book called The Bermuda Triangle Mystery Solved in which he did what few people had done before, apply logical reasoning and historical analysis to what is alleged about the Bermuda Triangle cases. Now, there's no way that I can go through all of Kush's book. You can find it on archive.org. I'll post the link to it in the description. Suffice it to say, in many of the cases he examined, the quote-unquote mysterious nature of various incidents became considerably less mysterious once the real facts were known. Case in point, the Cyclops, probably the most famous single incident besides Flight 19. The way the Cyclops story is usually told, she vanishes in March 1918 in calm weather with no distress signal and no wreckage ever found. In actuality, as Kush determined from contemporary reports of the disappearance, there was considerable question as to where the ship was when she was last heard from. Incidentally, the most usual position is that's given is outside the Bermuda Triangle, 
And in fact, there is evidence in the records of the National Climatic Center in Asheville, North Carolina, that there was a storm off the Atlantic coast during the Cyclops' last voyage, with 84 mile an hour winds and heavy seas, far from the calm weather mentioned in most Bermuda Triangle tellings. The design, construction, and loading of the Cyclops gave rise to a possible stability problem. She was top-heavy, especially in heavy seas, with a very real chance that the ship would capsize quickly without any time to launch lifeboats or send a wireless distress signal. This could and did happen to ships in the World War I era. Furthermore, it appears that the remains of the Cyclops herself may have been located on the ocean floor off the Virginia coast in 1968. Though not positively identified, the divers who found the wreck were pretty sure it was the ship, and its location placed it directly in the path of the storm that we know occurred in that area in March 1918, exactly the heavy weather that the Bermuda Triangle writers insist didn't happen. Conclusion, probably pretty likely that the Cyclops capsized and sank in a storm. Okay, so what about Flight 19? Well, examining the more than 400-page U.S. Navy report on that incident, Kush determined that the leader of the flight, Lieutenant Charles Carroll Taylor, got lost and disoriented somewhere east of Fort Lauderdale. He was leading a flight of pilots untrained in navigation. The whole point of the flight was navigational training. Not, it was not routine, and it was something that they had never done before. And the compass aboard Taylor's plane broke. The others didn't have compasses because the point of the flight was to teach dead reckoning techniques. They also apparently didn't have watches, which we know because Taylor kept asking the control tower what time it was. He was unfamiliar with the area and he made the mistake of not changing his radio to the emergency channel where the control tower, which had figured out his position, could have transmitted it to him. And again, contrary to the way that BT theorists all often tell it, the weather was bad, high winds and tremendous seas reported by one ship. When the flight was still out there, wandering around uh, after the sun set in bad weather, they were pretty much as good as dead. The planes lost radio contact and obviously ditched in the sea. So what about those strange transmissions from Taylor, the pilot? Everything is wrong, strange, we can't be sure of our direction, even the ocean doesn't look like it should. Well, in fact, those words do not appear in any contemporary in, uh, record of the investigation in 1945. The quotes didn't get attached to the story at all until 1962, when an article about the disappearance was written by author, author Alan W. Eckert. He claimed he couldn't remember the source where these words came from. In other words, it's fake. Okay, so what about the search plane also vanishing without a trace after Flight 19 disappeared? It did not happen the way that BT writers usually say it did. The search plane, a Martin PBM flying boat, took off several hours after Flight 19 disappeared, not right after, and a ship in the area observed an explosion and a plane the same size and shape of a PBM flying boat hitting the water. The danger of this kind of plane exploding when overloaded with fuel was well known to crews in the World War II era. Air crews, in fact, called this plane the flying gas can or a flying bomb. The Navy's investigation, in fact, concluded that this is what happened to it. So the more you know about Flight 19, the less mysterious it becomes. Curious, isn't it, how this keeps happening? A quote that's been circulating recently in 2021 explains it well. It's easy to believe in conspiracies when you don't know how anything works. This addresses number two of the Bermuda Triangle myth, the idea that incidents occurring here are uniquely mysterious. As we've seen, they aren't. So the list could go on and on. What about the Cotopaxi, the cargo ship that vanished in 1925 and which was famous enough to wind up as a gag in Steven Spielberg's UFO movie Close Encounters of the Third Kind, deposited by aliens in the Gobi Desert? Well, sorry, Steven, but the fate of this ship couldn't be less mysterious. Contemporary records from 1925 show that the Cotopaxi was caught in a tropical storm 35 nautical miles off of St. Augustine, Florida. The wreck of the ship was found over 30 years ago, but not positively identified beyond all doubt until about a year ago, February 2020. Notably, divers found the cargo hatch covers aboard the Cotopaxi were faulty, meaning that she would have taken on water during a storm. 
So let's take one that's not covered in Kusha's book, the disappearance of Perry Cohen and Austin Stefanos, both 14, who left Jupiter Island, Florida in July 2015 on a boat registered to Stefanos' mother. Notably, they did not have a GPS system on board. They told their parents they were going fishing, but they had also told friends via social media that they were actually trying to sail to the Bahamas. A thunderstorm well documented in uh, weather records came up near their position. Austin Stefanos even posted a picture of the storm on Snapchat. Their boat was found without them on it, drifting 100 miles away nine months later. A tragic occurrence, to be sure, and there was some legal wrangling about whether or not there was evidence of foul play, but there's clearly nothing paranormal about this disappearance. They were swamped in a storm and probably washed overboard. Not really a mystery in the sense that the Bermuda Triangle people want there to be one. The only question is whether this kind of thing happens more often here than it does in any other part of the ocean. So what about that? That's the first assumption on which the BT story rests, that this part of the ocean is uniquely dangerous. Turns out it isn't. How do we know that? Because the people whose business it is to know exactly that, specifically Lloyd's of London, the largest maritime insurance company in the world, and which has the world's most comprehensive record base of marine-related losses, does not show anything unusual about this area of the ocean in terms of the frequency of loss or accident. Lloyd's of London doesn't charge any additional premium for cargo or passengers carried through the area thought to be the Bermuda Triangle. Larry David Koosh found this to be the case when he wrote his book in 1975. It was reaffirmed again when the producers of a British TV show on the Bermuda Triangle checked again with Lloyd's in 1992 and found nope, no records of any statistically significant increase in losses in this part of the ocean and no special insurance rate supply. Think about this carefully. This is strong evidence. These people, Lloyds of London, know more about marine loss events than anyone else in the world, and they have for over 150 years. If the Bermuda Triangle really did exist, if there was evidence to support the hype, it would be in Lloyds of London's financial interest to charge higher premiums for ships that pass through that area, right? Why wouldn't they do that? Who or what could make them act against their own financial self-interest on a matter that they possess the most sophisticated data needed to substantiate? I have a little bit of experience in dealing with a question of what risks insurance companies think exist because of my work on climate change. Climate change is undoubtedly real and undoubtedly human-caused. The scientific evidence is clear and overwhelming. But it doesn't really matter whether you believe this or not, because your insurance company absolutely believes in climate change and is pricing the risk of extreme weather and sea level rise in every policy they write and in every dollar they collect from you in the form of premiums. In case you need any more convincing that the incidents chalked up to the Bermuda Triangle are not out of the ordinary for the mayhem that occurs on the high seas all over the world on a yearly basis, I suggest you take a look at one of the Wikipedia articles, one of the Wikipedia pages for list of shipwrecks in blank and fill in whatever year you, you like. Here's the one for 2019, the last year before the pandemic. Just scroll down and look at all the ships lost in various parts of the world. Just take a look at it. London, ship capsized off Taiwan, 10 missing. Zhihai, 189, coastal trading ship sank in a collision off Ningbo, China, 4 missing. NB, 8836, inland cargo ship sunk in a collision in Vietnam, 4 dead. Mary B-2, crab boat capsized in Yaquina Bay, Oregon, 3 dead. Zhongxing, 689, cargo ship sunk in the Taiwan Strait, 2 missing. Kurt Strait incident, 2 ships blew up in the Black Sea, 10 dead. This is all in January 2019, one month, and it goes on and on like that. Month in and month out, all over the world. The seas are dangerous, people. What's so special about the Bermuda Triangle? So I think I've made my point. The two assumptions on which the story rests, first, that this part of the ocean is uniquely dangerous as compared to other parts of the world, and second, that the incidents that happen there are unusually mysterious, we've busted both of those myths. Without these assumptions, the whole idea of the Bermuda Triangle collapses. The Bermuda Triangle does not exist. 
It just doesn't exist. It's a myth. Does anybody still believe it? Well, probably yes, because sensationalist media like this and this and this can get eyeballs by pretending that it's a thing. But in the real world, it's pretty clear that it's not a thing and never was. Thanks very much for watching. If you like this video, please like, subscribe, share, do all the stuff that you normally do for a video you like, and I'll be back again soon with more historical thoughts. Thanks.